Hoffman. This is uh, the book about political conflict in Pakistan. Uh, of course, all politics is about politics, about conflict, and most books written on Pakistan on any other country, particularly in the third world, uh, talk about the conflict, for example, uh, between the institutions of the state, uh, judiciary, parliament, uh, and the executive, and very often uh, rooted in the civil military conflict. So what do we have here? Uh, political conflict in a conceptual framework, which I've developed in this book, and that is that Pakistan is a prototype post-colonial state. Now, why should I stress that point? Because it's a, a very uh, obvious uh, fact about the third world countries, quite a few of them happen to be post-colonial, uh, because the conflict resolution mechanisms in these societies are different or less effective and less operative uh, than those in the other two kinds of states. And uh, among them, the first is the West, the uh, democratic countries, as they're called. Uh, they developed their institutions of the state in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and 20th centuries, uh, along with the social change, the transformation which was taking place in their class structures. Uh, and there was quite a bit of uh, interconnection and uh, shaping and making of each other, thereby the countries, England, France, Germany, Italy, and whatever in Europe and America, we see them as they are today. On the other hand, there are those countries where there is a traditional state along with a traditional society. So the modernist state, which uh, as I'll explain later, uh, tends to create and tackle conflicts, that is not the center point. For example, of Saudi Arabia, for, of, of uh, UAE, of other countries which have not had a colonial past. So here, we are confronted with the model of post-colonial states such as Pakistan. Of course, every country has its unique character along with this uh, typical character which puts it in a certain category. Uh, so how shall I proceed with my talk today about political conflict in Pakistan? First of all, as I've said, conflict is endemic to the post-colonial societies. Now, having said that, there are constitutions, there is an institutional design. This constitution provides congenial spaces for uh, articulating the conflictual demands of the society. And here we have, for example, various um, theories and case studies of these countries, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and countries away from South Asia, where there, there, there is an argument that this is the cause of the conflict, and also there is the argument that the conflict has done this to the body politic. On the other hand, the underlying thesis of this book is that actually conflict is the system, and that needs to be explained, but that certainly provides the general thesis about uh, the conflict in Pakistan, conflict in India, conflict in Sri Lanka, and so many other post-colonial states. Uh, in a way, I would go for the sociology of the state. So, and what is that? There, I would talk, for example, about conflict being rooted in the gap between the institutional design of the state on the one hand, and the traditional or not so traditional sections of the society. The historical West was able to keep the development of the state and society on parallel lines in a way, but that has not happened here where the colonial framework in a way uh, uh, 
constrained the development of social and political forces um, in the colonial societies. So the gap between the institutional design and the practice, there lies the root of the conflict which I try to uh, reach out for and try to uh, explore. And here I would say that the most common and most typical project in these societies is one of the nation building projects. Here is a nation building project in Pakistan, which while it progressed in the early decades, uh, it led to emergence of various conflicts, for example, along ethnic lines and along religious lines, particularly uh, in this framework, religion became a contested territory. And here again, there was a source of conflict which has become almost uh, permanent in so many ways. So the, the problem, the question, what's keeping this social fabric, like the social fabric of so many other post-colonial societies going? How is it that it didn't collapse in the face of so many conflicts? And there I would say the low classes, the subaltern at the bottom of the society was not a party to the conflict at the macro level. It was or could not become a challenge for the state. This is again peculiar uh, to these societies, particularly those societies which uh, were ex-British colonies rather than uh, those colonies which were once French or Portuguese or Spanish or other. My focus is mainly on the societies which were British colonies and today they are post-colonial societies and Pakistan is a kind of a uh, prototype of that particular kind. Now we have to see that partition made a major role in uh, the uh, birth of the country as well as uh, later on uh, in terms of its development of uh, state building. And there, uh, there was an agenda to de-Indianize itself. That is, the, the country should be known as a separate entity away from Pakistan. So there was this particular conflict, conflict on the one hand, between the cognitive self, that is that civilizational uh, framework, which had, for example, um, at its core, the cognitive self, that is the, the, the thousand and one manners and uh, belief systems and practices and customs and so on, sometimes known as Indo-Muslim civilization, uh, or in the larger context, of course, the Indian civilization, so that was one, the cognitive self. On the other, there was the need to build and follow the national identity of Pakistan after independence. So the conflict is born here uh, again at a different level. That is uh, what you were and what you wanted to be. So here, uh, very interestingly, uh, um, there, there, there was I.H. Qureshi and there were others. Uh, the, the leading authors and scholars of Pakistan, uh, who elaborated the two nation theory in terms of, again, conflict between the two nation-like communities for five, six, seven hundred years, for a millennium, as they talk about it. Uh, and of course, at the core of it, there were two faith-based communities uh, who were fighting each other. Now, I have looked at it, uh, the material leads to another conclusion. Actually, from 12th century, 13th century uh, onwards to 18th century, there wasn't much of conflict. In fact, there were no Hindu revivalist movements, Muslim revivalist movements, or any other religious movement. Um, so what was there? Only in late 19th century, you see a Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh renaissances, as they call it. And that meant 
the older pattern of intermingling of faiths was no more and everybody wanted to carve out space for itself in the new framework of British India. So that being so, here was the leadership in various communities, particularly in this case, the Muslim leadership, which injected the identity into the Muslim community all around and it traveled vertically down to the local level and horizontally to other regions of the world, uh, of, the, of, the, of the country. That means from UP or North India uh, down to South and East and West. So in this framework, what do we have? We have, for example, a, 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 a tradition, oh, a, yeah. a, a, a situation developing where first, again, in a conflictual metaphor, the way I've been uh, talking about, the state, the state itself, hello? Yes, the state itself uh, uh, was a migrant state. This, again, is my you know, framework. Uh, Pakistan started as a migrant state. Uh, the, the first governor general, the first prime minister, both from Muhajirs, and of course, there was uh, the largest number of uh, higher bureaucracy Muhajirs, and of course, the uh, commercial industrial class, most of it came from Bombay and some from Calcutta and Delhi, and uh, most of the intelligentsia came uh, again from minority provinces in India. And that means here was a state structure where at least in West Pakistan, 20% of the population was migrant from both the, the Muhajir and Punjabi extraction in India. While in India, the migrants who came from Pakistan were only 1%. So you can imagine that both at the level of state and the society, uh, the, the migrants played a far stronger role in shaping the contours of power in the new country. And here, um, the, obviously, the Muhajir uh, and the uh, Punjabi and other migrants who came from India and who were on top of the state structure, they shared one fear that if you hold elections, then you lose power because they had left their constituencies in India. So what would they do? Here, there was a dilemma. Here was a migrant state system or migrant dominated states which could not afford to go the quote unquote democratic in the sense that you hold elections and then the constituency politics takes over. Uh, and that meant that the middle class, which provided the non-parliamentary uh, force, uh, particularly the Muhajis, who were the epitome of the new middle class at that time, uh, that meant that the, the way they developed the narrative, that's very, very interesting. You know, Edward Said, for example, I've quoted him in my book, that the nations are narrations. The master narrative which they develop that speaks for building their self-image and, of course, their profile for the world at large. So the master narrative is something which totalizes the plurality of events um, in the history and makes sense of history. And thereby, master narrative is a big story which encompasses small stories. And thereby, we have, for example, the civilizational metaphor which dominated the master narrative um, from 1947 onwards. And here, the major source of this imagined conflict was between Islam and the West. So there is a dichotomous worldview from the very beginning, which took hold of the imagination of the people in the country. And here uh, we have what uh, other countries uh, have in the process of nation building, which is the need for the other. You have to have a, a demon out there to fight with, to save yourself from, to protect yourself from the presumed aggression from, from a from a devil out there. So uh, there was, if you know, mm, the demonization or cross demonization 
of each other between India and Pakistan. And there we created the Hindu demon. Uh, they, of course, created the Muslim demon. And that's what's going on. And in this framework, we relied on conspiracy. So conspiracy is part and parcel of the master narrative. We look at the world in terms of those unseen forces which are not there, which we cannot prove to be there, but which, according to our imagination, uh, play a role in creating conflict in Pakistan. And therefore, uh, various things happen. For example, in our master narrative, there were three things which were probably not so typical of other countries. One, the state of Pakistan was in denial of history. The history makers, particularly those who were uh, there, uh, very, very active on top of the um, Pakistan movement, the leadership came from the Muslim minority communities in India. That meant, the, for example, Jinnah from Bombay and Liaquat from UP and most of the uh, power wielders at that time who developed the whole idea of Pakistan. Um, of course, uh, they, they represented the Pakistan movement. After 47, we see that the history of India could no more be history of Pakistan. So uh, where to, to go? In India, of course, we were talking about two nation theory. All Indian Muslims were supposed to constitute one nation. But when in Pakistan, the question arose about what to do with our history, the local history, the history of Sindh, Bengal, East Bengal, and other areas, the regions in Pakistan, uh, were not part and parcel of the, uh, uh, the, the nationalist movement in British India. Therefore, uh, first, there was a kind of agnosticism about history, because uh, history then would be only um, the history of this part, because we have to de-Indianize it. Indian history couldn't be our history. Ashoka wouldn't be ours. Akbar or um, Darashko or um, various other uh, heroes which um, got uh, high positions, let's say, in the narrative of India, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't own Indian history. We had to go from scratch. So Faisal Devji, for example, and KK Aziz and others have talked about the lack of historical consciousness in Pakistan. Uh, similarly, there is the lack of territorial imagination in Pakistan. India, of course, had been known for a thousand years as a vast territorial expanse out there. So China and so many other countries of the world, but here was a territorial unit which was new to the world and new to ourselves. And therefore, uh, how was this country uh, constituted? Uh, obviously, uh, on the basis of 1941, census, that is, demographically speaking, the Muslim majority provinces provided the foundation for the state. So it was a demography rather than geography, which was the, the basis of this particular territorial state. And finally, language. Pakistan has been linguistically agnostic in as much as we refuse to uh, recognize uh, the, the, the identity politics based on language. In India, for example, um, they come to believe that language is a legitimate source of identity. Thereby, we see language-based provincial reorganization which took place in India, but not in Pakistan. In India, language was in, religion was out. It was secularism. In Pakistan, it was language which was out and religion which was in. So this way, the two countries developed on different paths. And here I must say that all this discourse created a, a kind of conflict between the modernists and the traditionalist modernists. For example, uh, you often hear that uh, Pakistan was made in the name of Islam. So the modernists would go the Muslim way and the traditionalists traditionalist would go the Islamic way. In other words, there was a different metaphor used. For modernists, it was the Hindu fear which led to Pakistan. For the traditionalist elements, it was the purpose of uh, establishing the rule of Sharia. So they were talking uh, along two metaphors, which 
sometimes, but I did, or rather often. Uh, and here, modernists have been trying to develop a worldview of their own, where divinity played a role, of course, where morality came up as a, as a factor, where spirituality was something which suffused the dynamics of the narrative. Um, and the, the process led to a framework of thought, which we can term as an alternative globality. We created our own world. That is the Muslim world, for example, uh, the countries, Muslim countries, and of course, the historical Muslim minorities in uh, at least three countries, India, China, and Russia, and of course, the um, Muslim expatriates in the West. Uh, so there is this there is this pan-Islamic framework, the world of Islam perspective. Uh, modernists in Pakistan have been operating along that uh, framework, of course, uh, along with the others, that is the other, that is the traditions. Here then, what did we do? What others do in the post-colonial space, which is the post-colonial framework of thinking. That is the, uh, the, uh, the way I have termed it, as return of the nation. Here was the colonial rule, then decolonization took place, and then emerged the nation. And uh, they wanted to do away with whatever the influences of the British colonialism were there, and to try to go back to the pre-colonial period. And that has been going on uh, till today, after um, 75 years uh, of, of partition here. And in the cases of various other countries of Africa and uh, Asia. So post-colonialism, I find it very interesting because it is basically the middle-class-based modernist intelligentsia which tries to dig up the ideological sources uh, in the, in the, in the uh, period before uh, colonialism. And there, Ashish Nandi, I have quoted at length in my book that he gives the idea uh, of, of losing the self, and now there is the period of recovery after independence, and which I, of course, uh, try to argue with. Um, but interestingly, he gave the idea of uh, a Bengali politician, Arvind Ghosh, uh, who was a, an almost an Englishman, studied in England, behaved like an Englishman, uh, spoke English far better than Bengali, and here he was, who came here as a refugee and turned to the revolutionary causes and finally ended up in jail and then lived his later life in Pondicherry, in the French-speaking uh, colony. Uh, I've used this concept of native, the return of the native. We in Pakistan have been doing the same, going back to our ideological sources. And there uh, you'll find probably some interesting case studies uh, following Talal Asal's model uh, of, of the way religion uh, is in and secularism must be out and so on. So uh, in this uh, context, in this framework of decolonization, we see that the local frame of culture was in a way divided. There was a national level culture, which is visionary, which has transformative the ambitions, that is, you all should be following one culture, national culture, Islamic culture. So there was the state using these terms uh, to cultivate sort of unity. On the other hand, there was, there was this concept of culture of the land and the people. The, this in Sindh, in Bengal, in various ethnic communities, they uh, could not take it lying uh, low that there is uh, something uh, by way of agenda as culture, whereby they had lived uh, their lives for thousands of years the way they were, and they identified themselves with their respective languages and cultures. So Indus civilization was one attempt where um, West Pakistan, uh, after Bangladesh, that is uh, Pakistan itself, tried to locate its history um, 4,000 years back in Indus civilization, but that particular project didn't go very far because it had a different language, different race, different uh, kind of um, customs and cultures. Uh, so that was so. 
In this context, I talk mainly about the two power centers. In Pakistan, and this is my uh, argument, uh, there are two players, the middle class and the political class. And the middle class, of course, is the catchment area for recruitment into the state apparatuses, army, and the bureaucracy, and of course, the judiciary. On the other hand, uh, there is the political class. The middle class is ideologically oriented. For example, who is spearheading the, the movement for religion? Middle class, intelligentsia, let's say. Uh, who talks about the national cause mainly or predominantly? Middle class. Whereas the political class would talk about the public interest. Middle class would talk about the national interest. Middle class about the public interest. In an idealized uh, national interest, you find the ambitions and the agenda of the nation. On the other, the practice uh, which was rooted very much in, the, uh, in these communities which are out there. So middle class has, like elsewhere, for example, in India, the fantasy of a benevolent dictator. There should be one good man on top, a leader who would take the country to the promised land. This is basically uh, the, the framework in which they operate. Uh, the middle class, uh, the professionals, intellectuals, others, I'm not talking about each and every one, but of course, typically speaking, uh, 80, 90% if the numbers are any relevant. So here, there is an ideology of meritocracy, which is developed by the middle class, uh, which serves its purpose, uh, whereby, uh, as Bokdo has, uh, for example, discussed in his treatise on education, the middle class has developed a, a, source, a source of uh, uh, legitimacy counter to the source of legitimacy in the mass mandate, which is what? That there is, there is justice rooted in talent. So uh, the uh, self-image of a progressive middle class, which is rooted, of course, in the modernization theory, which was very popular in the West and everywhere else uh, in the 80s, 90s, and earlier. So here, the middle class is the product or was the product of the colonial rule itself. When the, the language the ruling language shifted from Persian to English, and here was the first or second or third generation, which provided uh, India its proto-middle class. And here, uh, I would say that there was a transition from religion as source of identity to religion as source of identity, only a hundred and so years ago, late 19th and early 20th century, uh, both in India and Pakistan and other countries in the region. And of course, there was transition from harem to household. There was a kind of a domestication uh, of the articulate uh, classes in the uh, urban environment. Uh, that was again a source for the middle class. And there was a shift from the feudal sense of money to a bourgeois sense of money, uh, the modern sense where the public money was born as a concept. And here, the political class here is the middle, on the other hand, we've got the political class. The political class, of course, in that context, I talk about the party system. I don't want to go into detail right now, given the constraint of the time. Uh, these are the leader parties I have discussed, and they have hollow, meaningless party manifestos, and there is usually a disconnect between the leaders and the workers. Uh, and uh, the three major types for example, I've discussed in the, in the book, uh, again, uh, skipping the details, I would come to the iron law of oligarchy. Both uh, Mosca and Pareto, the Italian scholars have talked about it. Uh, the way uh, the, uh, the elite gets itself elected for the purposes of legitimacy. And in other words, pragmatic rules, rules, while normative rules couched in the constitutional framework were often forgotten, particularly uh, in the context of 
elections. So uh, in all this, there is something which has been missing uh, from the books quite a bit. And that is my chapter on an establishmentarian democracy. Here, the question often was raised in Western uh, capitals and otherwise in various uh, research books and articles. Why is India a democracy and Pakistan is not? And I've started my discussion from that point and I've talked about the way the Pakistan got a territory where uh, there were certain reasons why um, you know, the relatively underdeveloped uh, region, relatively underdeveloped political and ele electoral dynamics, particularly at the local and provincial level, and uh, relatively ideologically uh, oriented political uh, framework uh, was different uh, from India, where there was a the party congress, which was quite a bit middle class, along with the other kinds of elite, which was not the case in Pakistan. So the, the, for the last 20 years, the concept of hybrid democracy has been in, very much dug in, where they try, particularly Alfred Stepan and others, they have tried to explain these countries, so-called electoral authoritarian regimes, uh, which are not democracies even though there are elections. So this hybrid democracy in Pakistan's case, I've raised the question, the, the, the glass, the empty part and the full. Of course, hybrid democracy talks about the, the glass, which is only half full, but what about the half, which is empty? You can't use the same brush to explain, for example, Nigeria and Malaysia, and of course, Thailand and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and India and other post-colonial states in Africa. That's, that's, that's very difficult. What is peculiar to Pakistan? For example, in India, establishment, particularly the civil bureaucracy, which is far stronger uh, and has been so in, Pakistan, in India than in Pakistan. But there, it did not develop a parallel power structure, parallel to the political uh, establishment. But in Pakistan, it did. There were two establishments. Here was the establishment, which is called today, that is the um, middle class base, um, particularly led by the uh, uh, military and uh, only secondarily by the bureaucracy. Uh, on the uh, other hand, we have the, uh, the uh, other power center. So we've got the two power centers as bearing the greatest potential for explanation of politics in Pakistan. So their conflict, their collision, the, the way they try to outcompete each other, that is the story of Pakistan, particularly the way the, 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 uh, the, uh, the military and then the judiciary, they have staked their claims to power in so many other ways, particularly by inventing the, uh, the parallel source of legitimacy for example, the mass mandate as a source of legitimacy in a typical democracy and divine source of legitimacy, which was developed by Zia particularly, but also his followers. So uh, in the military's case, I've focused mainly on the concept of military metaphysics. What and how probably I'll urge you to go through the book, uh, the way I have talked about the cult of war, the cult of martyrdom, the cult of unity, and of course, the adverse view of the representatives of the public and whatever, which often led to Garrison Mullah Alliance. There is again a typology of course, uh, why the use of uh, judicial review so much, why there is the populist judges, particularly Chaudhary and the, uh, the other ones, Hakim Nassar, and the way they operated and the way the judicial autonomy has served the purposes not of the politicians, but the other power center, which is there. Uh, uh, and in these terms, the chapter on constitutional dynamics becomes very, very important. Here I say, law is politics. And in which way they use law, those, the competitors for the uh, position on top, 
here I've talked, for example, about parliamentary sovereignty as a major source of conflict. Mm, operationally, um, legislation has been overruled so many times, for example, by presidential ordinances <coughs> or uh, through an indemnification clause, which put together and legitimized all those orders and ordinances in 1985, uh, which were now, which were issued by the martial law regime, but which are now considered to be uh, based on parliamentary action. So these are considered to be uh, parliamentary legislation. On the other hand, structurally, parliament has been weak. For example, it has been justice is dissolved or um, dissolved or dismissed or whatever has been happening, particularly uh, coming to recent examples of dismissal of uh, the prime ministers, two of them, Girani and Nawaz Sharif. And coming to the clash of institutions, you and I know very well that judiciary and parliament have been uh, particularly at loggers head, whereby uh, even the, the, there not being a military regime, these two uh, institutions have been uh, clashing with each other. So federalism in the same way, uh, state managers view federalism as a potentially disintegrative framework. People move away from each other. On the other hand, the theory and the practice says that federation is a method whereby you keep the level of conflict low because you tend to accommodate the dissident voices uh, rooted in various federating units. So um, we experienced uh, with various uh, models. The 1973 model, of course, uh, is in front of us and we know it. It has been then uh, improved, let's say, a little in the, in the, in the framework on the 18th Amendment. This is very controversial. The way federalism in, uh, in law, uh, in terms of the black letter law, the way it has been moving is not uh, according to the ambitions of the, the, of the center as such. Uh, particularly the establishment. And I have also discussed the Islamization of laws, how they progress, how the Islam uh, moved from a matter of conscience in its early history, that is the history of Pakistan, to a policy, uh, to then a law, and then to formation of the institution like uh, mm, IIIC uh, and so on. So uh, there was also a kind of a parallel judicial system in the form of uh, FSC, Federal Sharia Court. But again, despite all this, despite the Islamic uh, legislation and institutionalization, the supreme power remains in the hands of the constitutional state. That is my finding in the book, how and why, uh, despite the accommodation of various kinds, uh, this state uh, have maintained the ultimate initiative in its own hands. And then I move away from the state to the mass public. And I've talked in this context, for example, that the public, the public means a, a, a discursive space out there where the group consciousness operates. There are various forces, non-status forces. They try to put up their agenda and uh, they have their own set of objectivities. Social textures are there, for example, configurations, and uh, they have developed over time. They have their life of their own, for example, separate from the state. So here, uh, the public space has provided various forms of activity, intellectual, away from the state, for example, street power. So Pakistan, represents, like other post colonial states, some kind of public space out there. Um, uh, I would uh, argue, as I've done in the book, that the British imperialism was the most developed imperialism in the world in the 20th century, which had created some space here and there, although most of the laws were there um, to legitimize the state itself, but that was possible only in the new framework by giving legitimacy to public space itself, where all the nationalist movement 
took place and where later on uh, you and I go for public demonstrations and uh, go for public meetings. I have in this context talked about civil society and NGOs. Civil society has been accredited with being a route to democracy. The stronger civil society means the nearer the goal of democracy. I have argued against it. I've said no, apart from the, from the, the, the example of Poland, for example, uh, where, of course, civil society did play a role, but that was an exception rather than the rule. Nowhere else civil society has been able in the third world to uh, move the way, to, to carve out the, uh, the, the, the route to democracy. Uh, why and how? Its agenda is limited. It is donor driven. The political regimes in various countries, including Pakistan, are inhibitive in nature as far as the NGO activity is concerned, and so on. So, uh, I've, for example, relied on the concept of projectized democratization, sometimes taken up by these NGOs. For example, training the, the party cadres in terms of uh, how to operate, how to um, uh, operate particularly within the polling station and so on. So uh, apart from the civil society, then I've talked about the education, the, third, the second major area which covers the public space. And here I've seen the education carving out the ideological space for the state, which is uh, what it is finally leading to monovisual approach. And here I have uh, taken up uh, the analysis of HEC's vision of higher education in Pakistan. Uh, the use of hyperbole, the, the, the utopian sort of uh, goals which it has set for itself and so on. I'm sure you'll find it interesting, particularly uh, the way I've talked about the textbooks where there is a pedagogical crisis uh, for decades now, and we have to look at it. Uh, so uh, the, there is an implication uh, in these textbooks, for example, that the, 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 there is a subtext, ideological subtext, for example, that democracy is a Western system and decolonization we must follow, which is again, uh, implied anti-Westernism uh, or, or, or uh, the, uh, the, the gender, uh, whenever uh, there is a talk about it, uh, the message comes out, one of gender inequality, uh, even though the institutional design, which is the constitution, um, you know, talks uh, um, just opposite of what the practice is in education. And I've or finally talked in this chapter about the media. The media, particularly uh, the way it is constrained by successive regimes, and now social media, the way it is uh, um, yeah, penetrated by the powers that be um, um, through trolls and whatever. So the whole idiom is different from the politics out there. Uh, in a way, the, the social media has provided an outlet to the uh, sentiments which were out there, not finding outlets, particularly um, the militant uh, media, and of course there are others. The final chapter deals with the outsider, the outsider, the ethnic outsider, Bengali, Sindhi, Baloch, Pakhtun, the, the insiders mainly, or rather the core insiders who are Muhajirs and the Punjab itself. So why has this alienation continued for so long? Uh, this is uh, something of an agenda for us, the researchers and the articulate public to consider. Uh, we are not talking about the outsider in terms of wealth. For example, there are individuals, billionaires uh, among these uh, outsider communities. That's not the issue. The issue of is one of ethnic outsiders and the minority outsiders, Christians, Hindus, uh, Ahmadis, uh, Sikhs, Parsis, the, the, the ethnic outsider, what has been the state's 
policy towards them. And of course, there are sectarian outsiders, Shias and uh, Zikris, Hazaras. So I have dealt in detail about these communities in my book. And uh, I end up uh, by um, uh, discussing the two strategies of the state. One, keeping the outsiders inside. How do you do that? There uh, lies the politics of accommodation. For example, the separation of Karachi from Sin, 1948, annulled in 1970, after a lot of damage was done. Bengali language should be the national language. No, and then yes, after a lot of damage. The, yes, the, the one unit, that means the destruction of federalism at the level of West Pakistan, a lot of damage. And then the state found it convenient to undo it, uh, keeping the outsiders inside. And of course, presidential system, which alienated the whole nation within seven years, 62 to 69, and then it was undone. And the quota system, again, uh, the Muhajirs uh, loathe it. They find that they have lost a lot. They happen to be um, the most educated community in their own eyes and in the, in the eyes of the researchers, uh, very many. So, uh, but the state has kept it intact to appease and ameliorate the Sindhis, which happen to be the outsider community. Similarly, Kalabagh Dam, the, the state and the Federation wants it done, but in view of the dissident voices from the three smaller provinces, no, it has not yet been uh, taken up in earnest. And then, of course, repatriation of Biharis I've talked about. The, the, the insiders, particularly the Muhajis, wanted it, but Sindhis didn't want it, and the state kept away uh, from pursuing it. And then I've talked, for example, about uh, the last section, which is keeping the outsiders out. In other words, not being able to uh, keep them inside. For example, ethnically speaking, it's the Baluch, and minority-wise, it's the Ahmadis. So these two communities are still not in a position where the state would tend to uh, bring them in fully, comprehensively, and meaningfully. So ladies and gentlemen, here I was talking about the conflict in Pakistan. In various ways, it unfolded uh, itself uh, through the clash of civilizations, clash of ideologies, clash of identities, and clash of interests, for example, and clash of mindsets, uh, which has uh, been operative in the country. And uh, this, not, uh, this is neither a pessimistic sort of view nor an op optimistic view. This is the view of a person who wanted to explain the, the, the multiplicity of actors and um, narratives out there in the society and the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasim. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. A very nicely summarized, very good book. Let me just raise a few questions. And meanwhile, I ask everybody to raise your hands, please, so that I can bring you in as you like. I want a very quick question, if you can answer it. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, as both you and I grew up in an era where we were fascinated by the Hamza Alvi thesis of state in post-colonial society. And even though it was a very half-done thesis, he never developed it fully, but he had the vague idea, which I think is very important, we needs to be developed, that we did inherit the colonial state and we preserved the colonial state and we are still preserving it. There has been some efforts to, to change, to reform the colonial state, but we never did. And what we did, did was keep the structure constant. We imposed Islam on it, imposed various things, but we kept it constant. So the issue is that the state, uh, the colonial state, um, you've raised all kinds of factions and things, but I think one thing is important. Yeah, you talked, of course, you talked in real terms about the army, but the role of the bureaucracy and the colonial state as a whole, including your and my profession, which is the teaching profession, which is also a colonial tradition, and the legal and the judicial profession. You've talked about the judges, but only at the top. But the whole judicial system, in my me in mind, needs a bit of a review. So if you can answer this very quickly, I have another question kind of related to it. First of all, there is no going back. 
uh, if it was not the case, there would not be a post-colonial state and its dilemma, which is wading through the muddy waters of modernity on the one hand and tradition on the other. So uh, we can only go <laughs> ahead. Universities cannot be rolled back in the name of colonial educational system. The whole medical system cannot be rolled back in the name of colonial uh, health system and so on. The point is that you cannot take up existence uh, both of uh, uh, yourself as a society and of course the, um, the, the ruling mechanism uh, and take it to 18th century or um, still uh, further back. So we have to be realistic. What we are doing is itself post-colonial in a positive sense, which means that we are <coughs> to, to develop our um, strategic powers, educational uh, potential, and in so many other ways you want to go ahead. And that's very much given the framework, which is the global framework. What is wrong uh, with the idea of the colonial state uh, apart from Alavi, who was talking mainly about the, the, the competing powers and controlling these powers. What, uh, the, what I want to talk about is that we tend to talk in terms of uh, Orientalism, I'm sorry to say that. We tend to orientalize the West, East versus the West. That is no more. We are, we are, we are groping in the dark. There is a global framework, import, export, uh, educational institutions. Most of you, you and I, and most, very many others, uh, we either go to the West for study or do whatever, or uh, we are, uh, we go through the Western <coughs> at home. So the, this binary is outdated, let's say. It is orientalist framework. We have to talk in terms of the global part. Okay. okay. Thank you. No, good, good point. But I see my point was not that, uh, you know, can go back or whatever. My point is that we lacked the intellectual wherewithal as a society to be able to work with our colonial state and change it. And especially, this is where the second question comes in, especially in line with the increasing needs of technology and globalization. Even today, for example, despite globalization, despite technology, we still have the old Fitewali file, we still have the Patfari Latta, we still have the old system of Deputy Secretary and Secretary. I mean, all those things remain the same, despite the fact that the globalized, we've entered the globalized world. So we have lacked the wherewithal now, but I want to get to, the, get to the main point. The main point is from the very beginning, what you're talking about is very well, you're talking about it, but I do economics. And on the economic side, we did a webinar with uh, Gustav Papanek about two years ago. Please, I would urge you to check it out mm -hmm. on YouTube. Gustav Papanek, you'll remember, he came in, designed a policy, and he was very clear. You did not know how to be economic, so we did it for you. That was his main point. He obviously nuanced in many things he said. I'm paraphrasing it a little bit uh, dramatically, but nevertheless, it's roughly the same. And to date, we have not been able to frame our economic policy. So there's the colonial state, fair enough, I agree the post-colonial narrative that you talked about, but I think we have not realized, at least on the economic side, we are incapable of doing economic policy. We have called the IMF in every three years. We copy every donor, we go begging everywhere. We are totally incapable. India is not incapable of doing its economic policy. Bangladesh is not, but we are totally incapable of doing economic policy. And we are totally incapable of doing a judicial policy. India is not capable or incapable of doing it. We see this thing, the river Ravi was, um, you know, taken out on Thursday. Monday morning, it was brought back. So, I mean, you know, this is bizarre. And, you know, so judges are collecting um, for Bhashka Dam and judges are doing all kinds. So, I mean, I think there's some amount of what I'm reaching for you is reflection that we lack the intellectual wherewithal. And we're just not capable of doing anything for ourselves. We need outsiders. And most important of all, I don't think anywhere in your book or most of people, uh, most of your, uh, you know, are leading thinkers of your category. We never take donors into account. We never take the new globalized environment. Has colonialism really left us or are they making us dance on a string? 
Well, yes. the question hinges on who has the ultimate initiative. The global powers, as you ended up with, they are doing it, they are keeping us there where we are, or uh, this is us, a state which is institutionally speaking, constitutionally speaking modern, but it recruited its personnel from this society for 100 years, 100 years in British India, in these environments, that is West Pakistan today, the British officers who came from the middle class, 85 of them from the middle class in uh, uh, UK, they came and performed the duties according to a framework, which is usually called a utilitarian framework, modernist framework, or whatever, where state was modern, and distinct from the society which is traditional and separate. Now, after independence, this state, which is modern, uh, but more and more skeletal uh, in terms of modernity, uh, has lost uh, what failed it, which was the, the, that European philosophy, uh, which uh, took roots here in terms of law, in terms of bureaucracy, in terms of military, in terms of various uh, rights, there was a rights regime here, all has been in a way uh, suffering. So what is this today? What do we have to do? You are talking probably, uh, or the way I would term it, the crisis of modernity. We, as a modern state, have not become modern, Neither India, I would uh, dare, uh, in, in a way, uh, move away from your, your, your position. India, Bangladesh, other countries here, there's a mess. And that mess is because of the, uh, the, the, the framework uh, of thought in which we move. For example, the, cap, the bourgeoisie in India and the upper caste uh, Hindutva go together. That's what's happening in all these countries. So uh, the initiative is lost to the citizen. Citizen is actually, in the end, the loser. In India and in other democracies uh, in the third world, uh, it is it is decitizenization which is happening, neither at the society's level nor at the level of the state. We are moving ahead. We are not. Well, there is a crisis. Anyway. So we'll continue to talk, yes. Thank you, Vaseem Saab. Let me turn to the floor. Uh, let's see. We've got Dr. Shweb Hedar Sayyad. Dr. Saab. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you. Hey, Dr. Saab. Uh, Dr. Shweb Hedar Sayyad. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me not uh, uh, involve in uh, justification. Okay, uh, I am Shabib Hadar Sayyad, and uh, I am at the uh, University of Saint Jamshoro. Mm -hmm. My question is: Why uh, middle class is too much tend to to religious uh, thinking, and then they they look for a leadership uh, which get them out of uh, all these uh, problems and issues? Thank you. Yeah, okay. The middle class. The middle class has no electoral base at the constituency level. How to operate in the arena out there where the claimants for state resources fight with each other? Political class has a mass mandate to begin with. So, the state comprises mainly two state apparatuses, which is army and bureaucracy, the military and the bureaucracy, and of course, the third one, judiciary. This is the catchment area for the middle class. Middle class has a near monopoly over higher education, near monopoly over merit in educational terms. Uh, so that gives them, number one, uh, a place in the merit system 
which the state has carved out for itself. So their position is safe. They reproduce themselves. They don't have to go to the society and seek legitimacy. And therefore, they have been, or at least uh, a large section of the middle class has been a constituency for the military's rule. Why? Because number one, the democratic politics doesn't give it a place. Power. Power comes from the state apparatus, which is the natural uh, area uh, to operate for the middle class. So it is both the product and the uh, the, 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 the product of the uh, modern educational system and professional system on the one hand, and the greatest contributor to its consolidation, where democracy is, in a way, delegitimized as a uh, discourse, as it's, it's merely uh, a hulk of the uh, institutional structure of a typical democracy in the West. So there is a parliament, yes, there, there is the voting system, yes, there is even local government sometimes, yes, uh, but the, 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 the power, for example, of policy making is totally denied to the public representatives. On top, no. So what happens is that then the source of legitimacy is religion, if not mass mandate, if not public will, if not the aggregate public will, then what? Then there is ideology. So in India, for example, the middle class, uh, they, the bureaucracy, for example, it shuns democracy. It hates the guts of what they call netas. They, they loot the people. They, 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 they have destroyed this nation and whatever. So I don't want to uh, expand on that. The middle class is the ultimate conservative class. It's, it's, it's progressive. Uh, it's socially progressive, politically conservative. Thank you. Hello? Dr. Sridharan. Ji. Uh, Aswaran Sridharan. Hello? Yes, Dr. Sridharan. Unmute myself. Can, can you hear me? Can you Hello? hear me? Yes, Hello, I can hear can you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Good evening, Guzim uh, Wonderful to uh, congratulations on the book, and uh, uh, I look forward to acquiring it and reviewing it. Uh, I think I'm the only person here from across the border. So greetings from Delhi. Uh, I have a question about the middle class. I have worked on the middle class in India, and yeah. like in most developing countries, the middle class uh, is very heavily uh, uh, in the state sector, in government and uh, public enterprises. Uh, yes. in, my estimate was in, in around 2000-2001, uh, about something like uh, two-thirds of the Indian middle class, I divide it in various ways, are in the state sector uh, or dependent on state subsidies in some way. That's now, right. in Pakistan, is it the same situation? Uh, is it this, uh, uh, or is there a large private sector middle class emerging? I mean, which is outside the state in uh, private industry and trade. Uh, if that sector grows, and it, in India it's growing with economic liberalization and growth, then it has a, a political, sociological implications about the uh, shift of uh, changes in the power structure. So is there, uh, I mean, of course, I'll read your book, happily read it, but... Uh, uh, is uh, do you uh, deal with this issue about the uh, state centric character of the middle class and is there a private sector middle class emerging? Thank you very much. Both expressions are very much dear, um, dealt with in different ways, of course, in my book. First of all, let me inform you that I have read your uh, work on the middle class, uh, like. Uh, uh, other work on Indian middle classes, and I've quoted, and I quoted you as well. So um, the middle class in Pakistan, of course, first of all, uh, it has grown outside the state structure, particularly in the uh, commercial sector, and not now. It has been there growing. Um, in fact, before the Indian middle class, particularly the commercial middle class, uh, caught up with Pakistan. If you remember, in the first 
uh, decades, the Nehruvian era, uh, there was quite a bit of state controlled uh, system in India, whereby Pakistan had a relatively free enterprise system at that time and now. But what I'm saying is that the middle class was able to remain powerful from the very beginning in Pakistan, both through the middle, uh, through the state apparatuses, for example, the army and the bureaucracy, and as I earlier said, judiciary, uh, whereby parliament was kept in check. So it was a pattern of rule outside the parliament, which continues to be the rule, effectively speaking, even today. So middle class is re reproducing itself all the time, and it doesn't feel the need to seek legitimacy from the society because of its merit-based uh, credentials, and, and it has kept uh, those credentials very much relevant for uh, for uh, being in in a power position, powerful position. So what I'm saying is that uh, it's not that it's emerging as a uh, as a player on the stage uh, of political power in Pakistan. No, it's there. It has been there. Uh, in fact, that's one reason why I have argued that the middle class has the has been the ultimate beneficiary of whatever the state system is in Pakistan, uh, democracy or no democracy. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, it has its uh, a fear of the mob taking over uh, the state and losing the initiative to these un un. Uh, uh, organized uh, superstitious illiterate masses out there. That's why indirectly or moving along the same line, they don't uh, appreciate the potential of the politicians to rule this country very much. So yes, they have been there in the power structure and it, they are not new on this page, uh, not directly, of course, they're not politicians, but indirectly uh, while the population is uh, you know, exploding, and there are so many other issues. One thing which I uh, want to end up my argument with uh, in this answer to your question is that middle class is, typically speaking, not uh, reformist in its vision and its practice. If, if, if reform was part and parcel of its uh, the collective vision, that uh, all this illiteracy, 20 million children out there out of schools and the, the, the gender issue and environment and population and so many other issues, middle class is mainly uh, not uh, very much uh, committed to bring out a change in so many public sectors. Yes? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Jee, much. Heather, sir. Ji. Heather sir, Heather sir, go ahead. Mute it. So, uh, Wasim sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hello. Ji, Wasim sir, Heather Nizamani here, one of your yeah. kind of students. And uh, so first of all, echoing uh, our kind of the views of uh, earlier participant. Congratulations on the book. And uh, so, uh, first of all, I mean, like say, uh, I must confess <laughs> that uh, I haven't read the whole book. So my question may be just because not having read the whole book, uh, but looking at kind of these two analytical categories of middle class and political class, and as a uh, kind of binaries that, uh, uh, that you help us navigate Pakistani politics with, on that, when I look at that, like middle class uh, from the very beginning, one sees that, uh, initially because the migrant state and its representatives, they didn't want to go to masses, right? <laughs> Hence, there was kind of say the, that to me lies at the root <clears throat> of middle class going certain way and what you call the political class going the other way. But when I look at Pakistan's history, even what would constitute as political class, but challenging the middle class, that also came predominantly from middle classes, especially in United Pakistan, like uh, uh, Awami League was quintessentially a middle class party. 
right? And even if we look at some of the outsiders that you mentioned to the system, whether it is uh, the Sindhi nationalist or the uh, BSO, or uh, so even those outsiders, they would, they would kind of come from the middle classes. So what I was wondering is that having those categories as middle class versus the political class, to me, it look, seems that that category of, because both are political, like middle class has its politics, like uh, uh, whatever is meta narrative and all that. So am I kind of say, reading it somewhat correctly that middle class is essentially anti-politics class, that it doesn't want to kind of say, it, it doesn't want to settle scores on the political field through reference to masses or electoral politics and, uh, and, and what we call the political class, it basically wants to draw its legitimacy by going back to, to masses. So just kind of say more, more kind of a question seeking uh, clarity as, a, as an old student. Well, Thank you. Hajane Zamani from Simon Fraser University in Canada. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the idea is uh, part of the question has been answered by you that middle class is anti-political. This is it. Uh, the voting exercise, in a way, alienates it and uh, disappoints it. And it has been written, for example, I've quoted Jenner Shirley, look at these masses. They elected people like <laughs> the uh, MNAs and MPAs of Awami League at that time in 1970, which led to whatever uh, happened afterwards, meaning thereby that uh, <laughs> voters are discredited for electing uh, not good people, those who are not patriotic, nationalist, or whatever. So middle class has its own universe where the uh, and the enfranchised public uh, has no uh, input, let's say. Uh, on the other hand, you mentioned about uh, the middle class in various other communities. <laughs> of course, they are there. And I have used the word that uh, they, the, the, the strongest middle class was, of course, Muhajir uh, in the beginning, and then came up the Punjabi middle class, and they have the largest representation in the service sector uh, still. On the other hand, I also mentioned that these middle classes and their lesser compatriots in smaller provinces. There are, for example, there is a Sindhi uh, middle class now. Uh, there is a tiny Baloch middle class. And of course, with the Pakun, the point is that quintessentially speaking, the, 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 the ultimate representation of the middle class in Pakistan lies in the hands of the Muhajir and Punjab, of course, along with others. Yes. Ji. Thank you, Vaseem Saab. Ji, let's go to Shazia, Shaza Khaja. Shaza Khaja. Shaza Khaja. Hello. Hello. Shaza. Hello. Dr. Vaseem. Hello. Thank you so much and congratulations on your book, first of all. Um, your, uh, this uh, book launch has taken me back to my old lumps times when I was a student <laughs> with you. <laughs> and I've taken a lot well, of notes. You are now uh, MNA. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. So, uh, Dr. Singh, my question would be, uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, the first one would be that, you know, how our national identity and our people are now, now identify more with their religious identity, I, I believe, as opposed to any other <laughs> alternate form of uh, national identity. And religion has become uh, the prime, uh, you know, center of nationalization. And our nation building, all other alternate perspectives, I feel have, uh, you know, really gone, uh, uh, taken a step back as, com as compared to religion. So how, how do we as, let's suppose, legislators and also the academia and in intelligentsia, uh, how can we together play a role uh, in building a strategy uh, that can actually, you know, bring about uh, alternate ways of how we as a nation associate ourselves uh, and uh, so that you know there's a better nation nation building amongst 
uh, upcoming generation at least. And uh, my second question uh, would be that um, you spoke about how the middle class talks about the national interest while the political class talks about the public interest. And uh, so uh, within this question, A, how much of a conflict do you see between these two interests? And uh, at what, what point and how can these two interests, do you believe, uh, can be aligned? Okay, number one, uh, the, the most established state systems in the world, let's talk in terms of ideology about them. Do you know or I know about American ideology, French ideology, British ideology, German ideology, Italian ideology? If not, why are they nations in the first place without ideology? particularly United States, the very name, United States of America. Is this an identity to carry? So what is it? Why is it that the third world is so much preoccupied uh, with identity uh, and, of course, in search of a source of legitimacy in religion? What is the issue? And if not religion, any other ideology, uh, so what is it? Uh, particularly in the post-colonial framework, I would argue, and I have argued earlier, that there is a gap in the institutional design and the practice. The constitution provides for, for, for protection against discrimination against on the basis of gender, on the basis of caste, on the basis of uh, uh, class, and so many other things, on the basis of religion, and all kinds of discrimination is being practiced here. Women's role, caste structure, whatever you talk about, and the same in India and same in Bangladesh and so many other countries. What is it? Because the citizen in those countries has been uh, assimilated in the state system through meaningful representative rule, which is the ideology which operates in an age there, again in the West, where religion could not and did not provide a source of ideology for the last 200 years or more than that, where nationalism as such emerged as a source of both identity and ideology. What we have to do is, like other compatriots in the uh, third world, uh, where all these crises exist, that the real thing is distribution of resources, a, establishing a, a rice regime, which would turn or transform the masses into citizens who can perform duties and who can enjoy the rights, which is not there when they are masses, un, uh, uh, inquate masses undefined masses, faceless and nameless masses. So that is exactly uh, where we are lacking. That is the state and the society, they have uh, a framework uh, which has been uh, discussed, for example, in the context of Russia. Um, Russia became a democracy and the state and then the society, what links it is a very tiny hole. In other words, at the, in the medieval ages, if you remember, there was an, a, an hourglass. Ours is an hourglass society. The elite and the masses, the two halves, they are connected very thinly, which is not the case in the mature democracies, where there is a lot of institutional uh, uh, outflow from the society. Citizens play various roles and inform and define and constrain the, so the state which is not the way we operate in Pakistan. So we should be looking for the citizen. We should be looking for redistribution of the resource. We should provide a service structure in terms of, for example, employment. State is not responsible for employment in Pakistan, nor for health, nor for education, which is uh, the, 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 the framework there in the Western democracy. So I would say beyond ideology, actually, our power system is or has to be and needs to be legitimized, which will come only through the citizen orientations, which must develop. And of course, we have talked about national interest and public interest. 
how can they be combined? National interests, who talks about national interests? For example, these politicians who talk of public interest, when they go to the constituencies, they are very much uh, national in their framework. But electoral politics is per se, by definition, de-ideologized in a majority of cases of these countries. Ideological basis of election cannot sustain itself. Sometimes it has happened, for example, in one province in 2002 and um, somewhere here and there, small ratio, but otherwise, uh, uh, in India, for example, um, it is the gap uh, which is filled, fulfilled by the ideology. Um, in other words, it's in lieu of the uh, source of legitimacy. Uh, otherwise, yes, uh, public interest is the ultimate interest, uh, which can be defined as national interest. So this all this talk about national interest is a, an idealized notion of a collective life. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you so much. So kind. Thank you, Shaza. Hello. Ji, Amrutan. Ji, nah. Any other questions? Ji, is uh, Idris Khwaja here from Pait? Amrutan has a question. Okay. Aslam. Amrutan, okay. please go ahead. Okay, let me unmute myself. Uh, am I clear? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor Basim. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an interesting debate. I think uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, see clarification on two things. One is uh, the role of civil society uh, in our part of the world, in post-colonial society. The civil society has not been evolved in a in, in, in an historical continuum. And we have seen that mostly civil society operates in a Western Eurocentric framework. For example, uh, the NGOs and uh, international funded organizations working on gender, youth, many other issues, many fragmented you know, uh, projects which uh, work together. Uh, and, this, and this is a big constituency for middle class as well. So uh, we have seen that civil society traditionally evolved. There's a third sector between private sector profiteering and the central coercion of state operating in the middle to make space for citizens for the accountability. So what kind of indigenous civil society that, we, that you see? I, I haven't read your book, but uh, have you explored some sort of indigenous uh, you know, civil society, which can actually provide a constituency for middle class to reassert their participation in political process? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have dealt with civil society at length in my book. Uh, uh, the framework of my discussion is its role in building democracy which is the role which is discussed and has been discussed for the last two or three decades uh, in various uh, Western researches. So does it lead to democracy? This was the question I dealt with. Civil society most typically does not because uh, first of all, uh, they follow the projects here, in one locality, in the other locality, by way of improving the conditions of people of various uh, kinds, uh, or uh, in, in, in general, they don't have access to the masses at large. So you are saying that society could be a way out or a platform for the middle class. It already is. The NGOs have mostly the middle class chairpersons, um, uh, although the, 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 their teams come from various backgrounds, 
various urban intellectuals usually uh, who, who uh, lead these uh, NGOs. But obviously there are structural constraints. They can't go beyond a certain uh, line. For example, uh, third world societies are very conscious about protecting their sovereignty. And they feel that the West penetrates into their uh, society by way of uh, NGOs and therefore is a threat to the sovereignty of these countries. So that will remain so. In the last two or three or four or five years, uh, uh, NGOs and INGOs, quite a few of them have been uh, packed up and uh, others have been living in danger of being sent uh, away. Uh, and the same has happened recently, for example, in India, where NGOs uh, have been uh, discredited uh, through government action and so on. So that remains a problem uh, on the one hand. On the other, the middle class doesn't operate uh, mainly uh, through such platforms because middle class has access to the state apparatus directly. You have to have one connection in the army or the bureaucracy or the judiciary uh, and uh, a dozen or so families or 100 families or whatever, there is a small constituency for a bureaucrat, for a person from the state apparatus, uh, so as to articulate uh, their interests with the state. So middle class is uh, not uh, uh, positively oriented towards getting a wider source of legitimacy. Uh, 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 it, and that continues to be its dilemma. It hates uh, the, the, the input from the uh, masses, which doesn't go well. They, they allegedly uh, elect wrong people, uh, wrong leaders, and, they, and then they lead the country, or rather mislead the country, and therefore there lies the crisis of Pakistan. So middle class has its own uh, attitude. I want to elaborate on this, but I can't, I think the time is uh, passing. Yes? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Vasim, it has been an interesting seminar. Can yes, I ask one last question? Okay. Shift. So, as there has been discussion on uh, the middle class, so as we have seen in Karachi and other, it's generally believed that uh, the educated class and the middle class vote prudently. So, um, and they elect the right kind of leaders, but the, given the history of uh, our electoral history, this doesn't seem to be the case. So what could be the reasons why the educated class is not uh, voting very prudently? Are they not well informed enough to, or is something else is the case? Uh, the modernization theory in the West in 70s, 80s and before has injected the idea in the in the intelligentsia let's say uh, of, of uh, this country and other countries that the education leads to democracy the educated elite is the preserver of values and uh, norms of a society they are the harbingers of modernization and therefore, the illiterate masses are not uh, capable of uh, forming a government, for example, in Pakistan, uh, or bringing down a government. They are simply uh, not uh, capable of thinking aloud and taking part in policy making on top. No. So this is basically the thinking, particularly in the middle class, where there is a lot of um, distrust of the masses and their judgment. And the, mm, uh, the, the other side of this thing is that the middle class gives itself the credit of thinking on the, uh, on the right lines. The issue in those developed countries was what? Education? No. What was the issue? The issue was that we, the working classes, should get something out of the system. 
and educated, uneducated, poor, destitute, at the lower level, minors, laborers, nurses, others, all of them had one thing. They needed resources. They had interests. So the poor man in Pakistan has an interest in keeping the family going. The issue is what? Resource distribution. Middle class is extremely conservative and fearful about it because its position is insecure. Uh, it is not safeguarded by the larger base of legitimacy with a democracy. So it goes for merit, it goes for it, it sees itself capable of voting in the right direction. Now, your question why uh, did the middle class in Karachi uh, vote the way it did? etc. Maybe you are talking about the ethnic lines or whatever. Why people go ethnic in their political attitudes? Because of the demand for resources, either for tribes or for their ethnic community or their provinces. And they talk about it and they want to project the profile of their ethnicity or their community or whatever. So it was the Muhajir feelings of insecurity, particularly after the decline, or what I have used the word, nativization of the migrant state in Pakistan after 1970, when, again, I used the word indigenous revival to place, the local uh, power bases uh, emerged in Punjab and in Sindh and in Bengal, and therefore that changed the uh, predominance of Muhajirs. Till that time, for two decades, bureaucracy ruled supreme over Pakistan, even under Yukon, and that was led uh, quite a bit by the Muhajir bureaucracy. Muhajir is the epitome of middle class, but in the end, it is the interests. So the Karachi's interests after 1970 when Karachi became part of the Sindh and capital of Sindh, and there was this huge population of Sindhis, and there was a decline of Muhajis in terms of their share in the jobs. Where they were at some time, for example, in Pakistan Foreign Service, 55% uh, were Muhajirs, uh, while Muhajir population in Pakistan was 3%. This is a study, a PhD thesis from America um, in 1960s. What I'm talking about is why did they vote uh, the way they did in 1970s and 80s and uh, up till recently because of keeping or safeguarding their interests, middle class or otherwise. Sorry, it was a longish answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it satisfies. So, thank you, Dr. Asim. It has been a very interesting webinar and I hope and I'm confident that your book would be read a lot and we would benefit a lot from this. Thank you for being here. And thank you all the participants. Very good. Love. Thank you. Thank you very much.